Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X Research and Professional Physicist. And today I'd like to talk to you about my latest article entitled Planet X and Nemesis are here and reveal the true fundamental law of the universe. Now I have for many years wondered about the true fundamental law and uh, except the theory I has said that that is gravity and I have been wondering about this for many years whether gravity actually is what the accepted theory says it is and I believe that I have found the answer in observing the stellar cores that have invaded our solar system. So um, I have written this article um, trying to explain what I have discovered. Now, uh, Planet X seems to have been discovered from New Zealand by Dr. Robert Harrington, and so it must have come from below the ecliptic. Then the stellar cores that are now clustered around the Sun and the effects were also initially easier to see from the Earth's southern hemisphere, which suggests that these objects came from the same region of space, that is, from the southern hemisphere. And these may either have been shown the way to the Sun by Planet X or they may actually be part of that system. However, I think that is unlikely since the objects seem to be extremely numerous. There may, I think, be thousands of them in the inner solar system now. So it's more likely that the solar system entered an area of the galaxy where there was a huge number of dead and dying stars and that these stars found a way to the stars which were a part of the solar system. And Planet X uh, was found in the southern sky and the dead star which I will call Nemesis for now in the northern sky. They do seem to be a part of the same system as the Sun, which suggests that the Sun is part of a trinary star system. At least trinary. There may be even more stars in it. So the stellar cores possibly initially encountered and clustered around Planet X or Nemesis before finding their way to the Sun. And I believe that to be so because Nemesis is, was definitely described as a dead star that emitted no light from the time it was discovered and we were told about it in a newspaper article in December of 1983. I've written about that in my other articles. I, I don't want to go into too much detail here. So it seems likely that these stellar cores found Nemesis first, drained it and it became a dead star as well. So I have drawn a diagram illustrating my idea of what possibly happened. So we have this trinary system, the Sun, Nemesis, and Planet X. Planet X was at about 50 AU uh, in the late 1970s and Nemesis at 538 AU. So uh, outside of the solar system, which is just the Sun system, which is about 100 AU in diameter, um, not in diameter, in radius. Planet X therefore was within already, so they possibly um, were much closer, but in the southern hemisphere, so we have in the southern hemisphere the bottom part of the image and the northern hemisphere uh, the top part of the image. So we have the three stars moving um, as part of one system through um, the galaxy and they possibly encountered a region where there were many dead stars or brown dwarf stars or stellar cores as I like to call them now. We do know that most of them were small, some are even about the size of the Earth, some a lot of them are about the size of Jupiter and we have some extremely large ones that are up to four times the size of the Sun. 
And if Nemesis um, encountered them first, it's likely that he got invaded first, got drained, became a dead star. Some of, of these may have rejuvenated, which is maybe what her, her Calubus is, one of these rejuvenated stellar cores. Um, still a brown dwarf star, but now able to emit red light. And Planet X may have been invaded next, um, or and possibly was drained as well to the point that it's nearly a brown dwarf star and the objects uh, surrounding it uh, are possibly rejuvenated stellar, smaller stellar cores and once they become rejuvenate they're likely to go into a stable orbit around the central object and I'll explain that later on again now planet X is not likely to be a planet. I know that people call it a planet. That is because the ancient cultures did not recognize it as a star. They, they saw an object in the sky and they thought it was a planet. But the fact that it emits red light, it's not reflected light, it's actually a source of light. Only a star can be a source of light. And it develops two tails when it's inside the solar system, suggests that it is surrounded by a cloud of ionized particles. And the only way that an object would develop such a cloud of ionized particles is by going through the red giant and the white dwarf phase. So it's a star that has aged and gone through those phases. And that's how they, these stars develop a cloud of ionized material surrounding them. It has to eject its outer layers of ionizing material in order for that to happen. That happens when a star goes through a, an aging process, the red giant and the white dwarf phases. So Nemesis was initially at 538 AU. And that's when it was found in 1983. And uh, Planet X, also called Nibiru and the Planet of the Crossing. So this is the object that appears at times when there is great changes happening uh, on our planet. So this is possibly why it is he here. I have, however, found uh, that this object has been here since at least 2007. And this uh, appears in uh, my article, it's number 50, entitled Planet X is now trapped in the inner solar system, where I show the evidence for the fact that it has been trapped in the solar system. And um, so these um, objects, uh, well, Planet X should have gone out. It should have come in according to historical records and gone out again. The fact that it hasn't gone out means that our solar system has changed since the last time that planet X was here. And that is a possible indication that the stellar cores and the huge numbers of them in congregated in the sun's corona have changed our solar system. And so things are not happening the way it happened before. Now, um, these large numbers have come into the solar system, and yet the orbits of, of the planets have not been dramatically affected. There have been some disturbances, but they have been minor. And this suggests that, um, and some of these objects are huge, that the gravitational force um, is not the fundamental force that we have thought it is up to now and that mainstream physics thinks it is. The gravitational interaction is dependent on the gravitational constant g, which has been given the value of 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. And this value was first measured by Cavendish in 1798. And this constant is of fundamental importance both in Newton's law of universal gravitation, which is used to compute orbits within the solar system, and Einstein's general theory of relativity. And uh, so both theories of gravitation depend on this constant. However, attempts to obtain a more precise value for this constant has been in vain 
as it is as if g is not a real constant at all. So measurements carried out by T. Quan, Quinn and his collaborators in 2013 reveal, as the authors state, that there is now a wide divergence in recent measured values of g. So the more people devise methods of measuring g, the more they realize that it cannot be pinned down. It seems to vary depending on the type of measurement that is carried out. And this is very strange and suggests that the gravitational interaction is not a fundamental interaction, but rather the, the result of other interactions. And in fact, it is possible to describe gravitational effects in terms of the polarization of charge within an atom. This leads to the gravitational force being described as the result of the attractive force that develops between electric dipoles or as a result of an electric dipole field. And I have drawn several diagrams that explain how an atom can become a dipole or a polarized field. And polarized means that charge has been separated. So in a neutral hydrogen atom, we'd have the proton at the center of the atom, the electron orbiting around it in a circular orbit. Then the atom can become polarized when the electron moves to one side of the atom and the proton to the other. They both have orbits, but their orbits are now elliptical. The proton, which is the more massive of the two objects, um, has an elliptical orbit which is close to the focus uh, of um, the atom and the electron has an orbit which is further out. But this means that now this side of the atom is negative because the electron is negatively charged and this side is positive. Um, when the orbit, when the electron goes out to there and the proton to there, then the negative charge will move inwards, um, would move to this side and the positive charge to that side. So there is this fluctuation in where the negative and the positive are, but as these objects orbit each other. So the polarization um, is basically a charge separation. So the charge distribution um, is changed when it is placed in an electric field. And electric fields are everywhere in the universe. So this is very likely to happen to all matter w in the universe. So it is also a simplified explanation. Don't forget that all theories start as simply as possible. And then we build onto them a, as, as we can. So this is a simplified theory that uses only the electrical uh, force. We would have to, to make it more like what we actually have happening in the solar system at the magnetic force to explain all the effects. But just using the electrical interaction is a good start. And it just uses um, the electrostatic forces that develop between positive and negative charges. And this shows that the electric field is intrinsic uh, property of matter. And the magnetic field is intrinsic as well, because all atoms have an intrinsic magnetic field, which is why I think it should be added to the theory. And this theory also explains why G cannot be pinned down, as any disturbance to the electric field generating the polarization of charge or the separation of charge in matter would yield a slightly different attractive force, which we would describe as the gravitational force. And therefore, the gravitational force changing would lead to a, a slightly different G value. However, in a system in equilibrium, such as in a complete star system, no matter how many stars there are in it, uh, and left to itself without intelligent interference, in other words, the creation of artificial electric fields, 
this is probably not likely to occur. But when two star systems converge or when an outside body invades another, such as when comets come into the solar system or when other stars like the stellar cores, uh, the stellar cores do the same, the new systems are not in equilibrium. And the fact that gravity is not a true interaction uh, or true fundamental interaction becomes obvious. So this is what ha would happen in matter. We would have all the molecules or atoms making up that matter being polarized. And then they al would align themselves in this way. So positive is, is close to the negative part and um, and they would align themselves like this. This means that one side of the material become negatively charged and the other side positively charged. But in the interior, because of this alignment with positive and negative, it would seem to be neutral. And only the edges seem to have charges. So stars that go through this aging process uh, would go through the red giant um, phase are likely to absorb most of, of its planets. And Planet X um, may therefore have the objects that orbiting it may not even be planets. And this may explain why they survive being so close to the sun. They may actually be stellar cores that have rejuvenated by absorbing energy from that star. Now this illustrates how this dielectric electric field leads to um, the effect that we observe as gravity. So the matter that makes up an astronomical object, be it a planet or a star, becomes polarized. So that th this would be the axis of rotation of the object. So one side becomes positively charged, the other side negatively charged. The same happens to another object nearby. And then the positive side is attracted to the negative side, and this negative side attracted to the positive side. And when all these forces are added up, it looks like an attractive force from the center of mass of the object, which we observe as what we call gravity. So these, this is the force this object um, um, exerts uh, on another object. And this is the force that this object or that this object senses as coming from the other object. And uh, this would then be what we observe as gravity. Now, all planets and stars in the, so uh, in the star system are likely to be in an equilibrium state, which allows the gravitational force coming from the dipole field generated by the matter all the objects in the system are made of to seem to have a constant value, thus making the calculation of orbits using the Newtonian theory with a particular value of g possible. It is also likely that once a stellar core has gone through the rejuvenation process, which I have described several times, that is, the object absorbs energy in the form of light and plasma from the sun, and in the course of some time, it obtains enough energy to start emitting its own light. At that time, uh, it will too reach an equilibrium state with the system it has invaded or with the rest of the star system it has invaded and may therefore uh, very likely settle into a stable orbit in that system. So in conclusion, the stellar cores that have invaded the inner solar system have made it clear that gravity is not a fundamental force in the universe, but a derivative of the electrical force, which makes the electrical force the true fundamental interaction in the universe. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.